Hello, my name is Bill. I'm the pastor of Fellowship Bible Church. This is a space where you would normally find the Sunday sermon that was recorded during our 11 a.m. service. Unfortunately, we have problems with our recording software this week. The good news is the problem we had this week was different than the problem that we had last week, so we are making progress. I know many in our church still do not attend because of COVID. There's still a fear and uncertainty of being around crowds. So I've decided to re-record my sermon from this morning sitting at my laptop this afternoon. This is not the best way to deliver a sermon, but it's the only choice I have at the moment. Each of you is important to me, and I don't want anyone to be disconnected from our church. So even though I hope to be grilling around this time on July 4th, I'm going to do a second sermon from the book of Amos. To start a sermon in Amos, I actually want us to tell a story from the book of Daniel. You remember the story. It's the story of the hand that wrote on the wall. You remember that one? Belshazzar, king of Babylon, is having a big party. He's having a state dinner. All of his guests are eating and drinking and having a good time. And suddenly what looks like a disembodied human hand appears out of thin air. And that hand writes a message on the walls of the king's banquet hall. The disembodied hand writes many, many techno parson. Belshazzar, of course, is terrified. We all be terrified, too, if we saw a disembodied handwriting on our wall. The situation is even more terrifying because Belshazzar doesn't understand what the hand writes. Belshazzar doesn't know the meaning of those words on the wall. When a disembodied hand writes on your wall, you want to know what the hand is writing. So Belshazzar calls all his wise men, hoping they can decipher the message, but they can't figure it out either. Thankfully, the queen remembers that there is this old guy named Daniel who is pretty good at figuring out mysteries. He seems to have a connection to a god that the other wise men don't know. So Daniel is summoned to the banquet hall, and with God's help, Daniel interprets the message. Daniel tells Belshazzar that this very night, the kingdom is going to be taken from him. I loved that story as a kid. First of all, I loved that story because it proved it was okay to write on walls. I mean, if your mom yelled at you for doodling on the walls with a crayon, all you had to do was say, well, God drew on walls. Look it up, Daniel 5. Don't you know your Bible? But second, and more seriously, I always thought it was fascinating that Belshazzar was having a party on the night that his kingdom was going to be taken from him. I found it fascinating that Belshazzar was partying on, not knowing that he was hours away from being defeated by the Persians. That always amazed me. If you read the story, Belshazzar doesn't seem to have any idea that his kingdom's about to be taken. Belshazzar is having a party like an ordinary knight when in fact he is about to be conquered. That is the very definition of a false sense of security. Belshazzar thinks everything is okay. He thinks it's going to be a fun night of partying when his doom is right around the corner. Even as he and his guests get blitzed, an army is amassing around his city. Belshazzar is not unique in having a false sense of security. There are many people who live with a false sense of security. There are even other people in the Bible who had a false sense of security. Now, we might not be surprised that Belshazzar had a false sense of security. Belshazzar was a raging pagan. He was not a part of God's chosen people. He was a king who worshipped false gods. However, even God's people can sometimes have a false sense of security. One example of such a time is found in the passage for our sermon today, Amos 6. In Amos 6, we will see a time when God's people thought they were secure, when in reality their judgment was right around the corner. Uh, if you've been with us over the last few Sundays, then you know that we are in the middle of a sermon series based on the Old Testament book of, of Amos. We said that Amos was a shepherd and a big farmer who lived some 2,800 years ago. But God called Amos to be a prophet to the divided nation of Israel. Several hundred years before Amos was born, Israel had been divided into two kingdoms, a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom. Though Amos was from the south, he prophesied to the north. We have said that the topics of Amos' prophecies can be summarized with just two words. Both of those words memorably, be, memorably begin with the letter J. Those words are justice and judgment. Today, most people study Amos to learn about justice. Uh, we have a great deal of interest in justice these days. We have large uh, movements underway to bring social justice to our communities and to our nation. Uh, but... And Amos helps us see the strengths and the weaknesses of our modern justice movement. One big weakness we have discovered, 
The justice movement speak of justice, but they don't speak of God. God is the only, only truly just being that ever existed. So it is God's character that reveals to us what is and what is not just. Because God is just, he will one day judge the world. God will hold every man and woman accountable for what they have decided about Jesus and for how they have lived in their lifetimes. It is impossible to truly think about justice without thinking about God's coming judgment. So justice and judgment go hand in hand. Many of our modern social movements think that judgment is antithetical to justice. Our modern social movements are often associated with defunding law enforcement or abolishing courts. There's an assumption that justice is an impediment to justice. Now, judgment does indeed impede justice when justice is when judgment is corrupt. We have seen aim in Amos that corrupt human courts created an unjust society in northern Israel. But God's judgment is perfect and true and unbiased. God's justice and judgment should be the very foundations of human justice. It is no mistake that Amos speaks about justice and judgment together. In the end, you cannot have one without the other. So we come to Amos to learn about justice, but Amos also gives us lessons about judgment. And today, Amos' teaching once again emphasizes that theme of judgment. Now, judgment is never our favorite Bible topic. None of us comes to church saying, oh, I hope pastor preaches on judgment today. I am looking forward to a July 4th sermon on judgment. Since judgment is coming, we need to be prepared for it. Since we want a just society, we need to understand what God's judgment teaches us about justice. So go ahead, if you have a Bible, a Bible app nearby, open up to Amos 6. We'll be continuing our study today by reading the whole chapter, Amos 6, 1 through 14. And I know it's full of a lot of strange terms, a lot of strange geography, places we don't know. But hang with me as I read the passage, and we'll try to explain it all at the end. Amos 6, 1 through 14 says, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kalna and look at it, go from there to great Hamath, and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. The sovereign Lord has sworn by himself. The Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. If ten people are left in one house, they too will die. And if the relative who comes to carry the bodies out of the house to burn them, ask anyone who might be hiding there, is anyone else with you? And he says, no, then he will go on to say, hush, we must not mention the name of the Lord. The Lord has given the command and he will smash the great house into pieces and the small house into bits. The horses run on the rocky crags as one plow the sea with oxen. But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. You will rejoice in the conquest of Lod the bar and say, did we not take Kanaim by our own strength? For the Lord God Almighty declares, I will stir up a nation against you, Israel, that will oppress you all the way from Lebo Hamath to the Valley of Araba. Now, the theme of this passage is found right at the beginning. The theme of these verses is found in the opening sentence. Verse 1 says, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Verse 1 tells us that the people of Israel were feeling very secure. This was especially true of the rich and the affluent in that society. These people had confidence that Israel was a great nation and that Israel could never be defeated. The people of Israel basically believed that the good life they lived was going to go on forever. Now, it's hard to blame the people of Israel for their confidence. The people that Amos spoke to were indeed living a good life. As we said earlier, the nation of Israel had been divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. 
And when Amos spoke, Israel in the north was a powerful nation. When Amos spoke, Israel had reached the acme of its political, military, and economic development. There was no time before or after Amos when Israel would be so great. And so in Amos's day, the people of Israel had a great confidence. They were certain that their future was secure. The people of Israel believed that they were on the top of the world. They thought their kingdom would last forever. So verse 1 tells us all about the confidence of the people of Israel. But verse 2 tells us that the people of Israel are overconfident. Look at what verse 2 says. Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to Great Hamak. And they'll go, then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? Now, verse 2 is pretty confusing to us. I doubt that any of us majored in ancient Near East geography when we were in college. And so as a result, we don't know a lot about Kalna. We've probably never heard of Hamath. Now, Gath we might recognize. If we pay careful attention to our Old Testament readings, then we know that Gath was one of the five major cities of the Philistines. We know that the Philistines were perpetual enemies of Israel. You know, think David and Goliath. But our knowledge of the places in verse 2, for the most part, is very limited. The people of Israel, though, they likely knew all the places that Amos mentioned. They would have recognized every one. And in verse 2, God invites the people of Israel to go see those places. In verse 2, God says, Israel, go ahead, take a trip to Kalna, to Hamath, and Gath. Now, why does God do that? Does God think the people of Israel need to get away? Does he want the people of Israel to have a nice vacation in one of those spots? No, definitely not. Kalna, Hamath, and Gath were not good vacation spots. Travel agents were not booking trips to those destinations. It turns out that Kalna, Hamath, and Gath all had one thing in common. All three cities had recently been defeated by an invading power. All three cities had been leveled and ruined by an invading army. And God says to the Israelites, look at these cities. These three cities were all destroyed. War devastated each one of them. And yet all three cities were bigger than you. All three of these cities were richer than you. All three of these cities were more powerful than you. These three cities had every advantage over you, Israel, yet they got destroyed. So why, Israel, are you confident that judgment will never touch you? Why, northern kingdom, are you sure that you will never be destroyed? You see, this theme of Amos 6 is really a theme of false confidence. In Amos 6, God says to the Israelites, don't think you can live any way you want to. Don't think that you can ignore my commands and not be judged. In Amos 6, God says to Israel, don't think you won't be judged. Judgment is going to come and faster than you think. Judgment is right around the corner if you don't get right with me. You know, think about our sermon last week. We saw last week that the people of Israel were looking forward to the day that they called the day of the Lord. Now, remember what we said about the day of the Lord. We said the people believed that the day of the Lord was the day when God would come to visit them. The people of Israel thought that when God came to visit them, it would be a happy day. Israel thought the day of the Lord would be all about the judgment of Israel's enemies. But remember what Amos told the people. Amos told the people that God isn't coming to judge your enemies. God is coming to judge you. So don't be confident that everything between you and God is okay. It's not okay. God is upset with you and he's going to judge you because of your disobedience. God has been very patient with you, but his patience is almost exalted. Now, I have to be honest with you. I have no idea why the people of Israel thought they had God's approval. As I read through Amos and I listen to his words to the northern kingdom, I can't imagine how the people of the northern kingdom thought they were good with God. Think about what Amos had told us about the people of the northern kingdom. Amos has told us that the people of the northern kingdom weren't offering sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem like they were supposed to. Instead, they were setting up their own shrines and worship centers where they were not only worshiping God, but also worshiping idols. Amos has told us that the northern kingdom wasn't following God's commands. They were largely ignoring God's law to live their own way. In addition, the rich of the northern kingdom were stealing from the poorest of the poor to fund their own excessive luxury. The rich set up corrupt courts and a corrupt tax system to take from the poor even the little that they had. It seems pretty obvious to me that God wouldn't be happy with the northern kingdom. Yet somehow the people of the northern kingdom thought that everything was good. The people of the northern kingdom thought everything was copacetic with God. How could they have missed the truth? How could they have been so deceived that they didn't see the judgment coming? As I read Amos 6, I have to ask myself, where did Israel's false sense of security come from? 
And that's an important question that needs to be asked. You see, I think that we in the church need to ask that very question today. I'm not sure that we all are different than those people of the Northern Kingdom. I think there are a lot of people, even here in the churches in America, even evangelical churches, who have a false sense of confidence in the face of God's judgment. There are people who might think that they are okay with God, but God himself might tell a different story. There are people today who think that they can call themselves a Christian without living out their faith. Many of these people think that identifying with the church is the thing that makes them right with God. There are people in our churches today who have a false confidence about the future. And to diagnose this false confidence, we have to understand where it comes from. To diagnose this false confidence, we have to understand what makes us complacent about God's coming judgment. In Amos 6, God identifies two sources of false confidence. There are two, false, uh, the two sources of false confidence for the northern kingdom, and they continue to be sources of false confidence in the church today. The first of those sources of false confidence is pride. As you read Amos 6, you discover that the people of Israel were a very prideful people. The people of Israel thought so highly of themselves that they couldn't imagine that God could possibly be upset with them. Israel's pride is seen in several places in this chapter. Israel's pride is seen in verse 2. We've mentioned that already. In verse 2, the people of Israel have difficulty imagining their own downfall, even though more powerful nations than they have already fallen. Israel was thinking too highly of themselves. Pride is also seen in verse 8. In verse 8, God explicitly calls out Israel's pride. Actually, God says he hates Jacob's pride, but Jacob is another name for Israel in this context. Remember that uh, Jacob and Israel are the same person in the book of Genesis. And further, pride is seen in verse 13, right? In verse 13, the Israelites celebrate recent military victories. They brag and say, if we conquer Karnaim, who can conquer us? We don't know much about Karnaim. The details of that city are lost to history. History. But apparently Israelites thought that Karnaim was a really strong place. And so defeating them was a great military victory. And so as a result, Israelites bragged and boasted about their military triumphs at Karnaim. There can be no doubt the Israelites were prideful. Their pride made them miss the coming judgment. And pride can make us unprepared for judgment as well. Many of you know that famous verse from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. When we think we can do no wrong, when we think we are, we are indestructible, we are not too worried about judgment. Our pride blinds us to our sins and our faults and causes us to evaluate ourselves in ways different than God would evaluate us. That is what the Israelites were doing. The Israelites were so full of themselves and their successes that they didn't notice their failures. The Israelites overestimated their achievements and accomplishments. As a result, Israel didn't see the areas where God might be displeased with them. Now, history gives us plenty of examples of this biblical truth. History gives us plenty of examples of pride leading to destruction. Perhaps no example is greater than the example of the Titanic. You all know the story of the Titanic. Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Winslet, Celine Dion with her heart going on. You saw the movie. Okay, the movie might not have been completely true, but the sinking of the vessel certainly was. Many of you know that the Titanic sank on April 15, 1912. It was not the last day that people would get a sinking feeling on April 15th. That would happen again. Now, the Titanic sank on her maiden voyage. Now, if you remember the story, the Titanic was labeled an unsinkable ship. Those who designed the Titanic thought she was impervious to disaster. People were well aware of the danger that icebergs posed to ocean liners in the North Atlantic, but the designers of the Titanic felt they had designed their ship in such a way that an iceberg could damage the ship but not sink it. In fact, the captain of the Titanic is reported to have said that not even God himself could sink the ship. On the night that the Titanic sank, the telegraph operator received several cables from other ships alerting the Titanic to icebergs in the area. To the last of those cables, the telegraph operator replied, shut up, I'm busy. Apparently, the telegraph operator had no fear that the ship would sink. Everyone thought the Titanic couldn't go down. They had great pride in that vessel. Pride brought the Titanic full speed into that iceberg where she sank. And Amos says pride can do the same thing to us. You see, there are two types of pride that can sink us. Amos identifies two types of pride that the, Israel, that the people of Israel had. 
First, the people of Israel had the pride that says it can't happen to me. Remember what we saw in verse 2. Cities and nations around Israel, even very big ones, were dropping like flies. But Israel thought it could never happen to them. They thought they were exempt. This is the type of pride that the Apostle Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when he says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. I've met Christians who have this type of pride. They look at people committing certain sins and they say, I could never do that. I would never commit adultery. I would never steal from my employer. I would never walk away from church. In their arrogance, they think they are immune from the sins that beset other people. They think that they are better than other people. This is the type of attitude that begets a false confidence that leads to destruction. When you are so sure of your strengths that you don't see your weaknesses, that is a real problem. The second pride that the Israelites had was a pride in their ability. This type of pride is found in verse 13, the verse where the Israelites celebrated their great military victories. The Israelites said, look at the great victories that we have achieved by our strength. Now, they should have said, look at the great victories that God's strength has achieved for us. But that's not what Israel said. Israel didn't say we took Karnaim by God's strength. No, they said we took Karnaim by our strength. They stole credit from God and gave it to themselves. That is pride. It's the type of pride that the Pharisees showed in that story that was told by Jesus. Do you remember Jesus' story about the tax collector and the Pharisee who both go to the temple to pray? How does the Pharisee pray? The Pharisee prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. The Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I am so good. And I met Christians who probably pray like that too. These Christians think they are good people better than anyone else in the world. But the tax collector's prayer represents a healthier, more biblical attitude. In Jesus' story, the tax collector prays, God have mercy on me, a sinner. The tax collector knows the true measure of himself. He knows that his righteousness comes from God, not from his own good deeds. As Christians, we often get blinded to judgment and discipline because of pride. We get so sure of ourselves that we don't see the weaknesses that God sees. To avoid pride, we have to remember the message of the cross. We aren't Christians because we are such good people. We are Christians because God in his grace sent his son to die that we might be forgiven. The story of the cross keeps us from having confidence in our own righteousness. Because of the cross, we can't be proud of our good deeds. If we were so good, the cross would not have been necessary. We have to be careful not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. So the first source of a false confidence is pride. And the second source of a false confidence is riches. Riches can blind you and I to the coming of God. The Israelites had lost sight of God's judgment because they were too wrapped up in pleasure and luxury. This is highlighted for us in verses 3 through 7. Look there. Amos says, you put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. Now, in the 21st century, these verses may be hard for us to understand and relate to. After all, I don't know anyone who has an ivory bed. And most of us would not choose lamb as our first choice meat. So to understand this passage, we need to give it a 21st century update. This is how I think these verses might sound if Amos were to speak them to us today. You rest on your sleep number beds while you recline on your oversized sectionals, watching your 60-inch flat screen TV. You dine on shrimp, lobster, and filet mignon. You bop your heads to the hundreds of songs on your Spotify playlist while you pursue your dream of becoming a social influencer on Instagram. You drink wine and micro-brewed beers in outrageous quantities, and you only go to the expensive cosmetic counters at the mall. But the need of the poor in your land causes you no concern. Therefore, God is going to discipline you. He is going to unplug your TVs and show you that life is about more than the American dream. 
Now, as we read that reconstruction, we need to remember that the problem here is not necessarily the luxuries themselves. Amos is not telling the Israelites that it's wrong to own an ivory couch or to use expensive lotions. What is wrong is wallowing in luxury while other people are suffering. Rather than doing a little Rather than seeking a little less luxury to help those in need, the people of Israel were lavishing luxury upon themselves. And this consumption of luxury was making the people of Israel numb towards God. Amos says that all of Israel's consumption was causing them not to grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Joseph's another name here for the northern kingdom. Amos says you are numb to your true spiritual state because you own too much stuff. You are too in love with luxury. You have let your goods become the most important thing. And I think it's obvious that we in the American church often suffer the same malady. We are like the rich man in the story told by Jesus. Do you remember the guy that Jesus talked about? The guy who had the barns full to overflowing after his harvest? The guy had a crop more bountiful than he could have ever imagined. So the guy said to himself, now life is going to be good. I can retire and do all those things I always wanted to do. I can travel. I can golf. I can fish. The easy life has finally arrived. And what does God say to this guy with the abundant crop? God says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. What happened in that story? The rich man's wealth had made him oblivious to the future. It had made him miss the judgment that was coming. And I think the riches pose the same danger for us here in America, too. I think our wealth can make us very short-sighted. Now, some of us might deny that we're wealthy. But most of us are fairly rich. Compared to the rest of the world, we have lots of things that many people don't have. Our riches often distract us from what will happen after this life. Many of us are too busy planning for our retirement to plan for our eternal future. We're too busy watching our 70-inch flat screen to think about what will happen after we die. We are so wrapped up in getting that big home or that retirement home that we don't realize that someday we are going to have to give an accounting to God. An obsession with wealth can cause us not to think about our eternal future. We can't let our riches make us numb to the future judgment. The message of Amos 6 is simple. It is all about that second J. Amos tells us that judgment is coming. And as the people of God, we need to be prepared. And the chapter suggests two ways that we prepare ourselves to stand before God. Remember what we said last week, there are two aspects to our future judgment. One aspect of judgment is our entrance to heaven. Jesus has completely paid the price for that by grace. There is nothing that we can add. But God is also going to measure how we have used the blessings that he gave us. He is going to evaluate how we have obeyed and how we have served. How do we as Christians prepare for that second aspect of judgment? Well, first, we need to be humble. If pride makes us numb to the judgment and leads us to destruction, then we need to be people of humility. Unfortunately, we as Americans aren't very good at humility. Our political divides make humility even more difficult today. You know, living in a polarized land makes us think, you know, thank God I'm a Republican. I'm not as dumb as those Democrats. Or thank God I'm a Democrat. I'm not as dumb as those Republicans. When things get so divided, we can think that we are on the right side that can never be wrong. We see ourselves as better than those who don't agree with us. We see our opinions as more valuable and needed. Arrogance should not be the mark of us as followers of Jesus. We need to learn to listen to others. We need to learn to love people we disagree with. We need to learn to think of other people as better than us. In other words, we need to see the needs of other people as more important than our own. We, need, we have to assess ourselves properly if we are going to be ready to stand before God. So in preparation for the judgment, we need to cultivate humility. And in preparation for the judgment, we need to cultivate generosity. We talked about this last week. I'm not going to belabor the point here. Throughout the Bible, God talks about his concern for the poor time and time again. And we should have that same concern for the poor that God has. When Jesus was on earth, he told us not to store up treasures in heaven, uh, not to store up treasures in earth, but instead to store up treasures in heaven. And one of the ways that we transfer balances from earth to heaven is by giving to the needy. And so we should also budget to help those in a worse financial place than we are. It's easy to have false confidence, but when humility leads to generosity, we can be unashamed before Jesus at his coming. Let us not make the mistake of the people of the northern kingdom. Let's be people who are humble and who are generous. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the lessons that we have from the book of Amos. And Father, we know the time is coming when we will have to give an account before you. 
Father, we pray that you would help us to humble ourselves. We pray that we would take the true measure of ourselves and that we would give others the importance that they deserve. And Father, we pray that you would help us to share with others and to be generous, storing up uh, the reward that will never fade away in heaven. Thank you for the mercy and grace given us through Jesus. Thank you that he has secured the entrance into heaven. Let us be faithful servants and stewards of yours. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your July 4th. And if you have the day off tomorrow, I hope you enjoy that day as well. God bless. Lord willing, we'll have a normal sermon recorded next Sunday. Or maybe we'll see you in church. Hope to see you then. Take care.